Okay. Hey, Internet friends, this is Magic Brad with Synergy Cafe and the Synergy Collaborative, and I've got Dr. Hal, Dr. Hal Blattman. Mr. Mr. Blattman, are you available there? Yes, I am. Right here. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, we had a little bit of a chat. You're right now. You're, are you over in New York now? No, right now I'm in Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Oh, hi. Oh, I'm here in Minneapolis, yes. Minnesota. Well, like I mentioned, I don't do these real long because I feel that uh, people, you know, I got that, that commodity of time. They just can't spend too much time. So I kind of condense it all down and just find out who you are, what do you do, and how do you help people and <clears throat> things of that sort. So first off, are you married? You've got kids? Yes, I am married. Been married since, gosh, 1979. Wow. It's longer than me. <laughs> and how about kids? You got kids or fur babies? I have two kids. Um, one, they're both in their, in their early to mid thirties and one lives in Manhattan and the other one lives in Seattle. Okay. Out of the nest, no teenagers or anything like that. Right? <laughs> and off the payroll. <laughs> <laughs> so the kind of business, the, the work that you do is uh, from what I've looked at is, are you doing like natural pathic stuff or? Yeah, I actually think of myself as a naturopath in MD clothing. Okay, that's it. You know, kind of describes it better than any other three words I could do. <laughs> that sounds good. I'm, um, I'm an advocate of the natural kind of thing. I think your body, if you listen to it, it really will tell you a lot. You know, it, I mean, it lets you know when you're hungry, so you eat. But and we kind of don't fix anybody. We kind of teach people how to get out of their own way so their body can do what it knows how to do. And then we try to facilitate the path where the body's stuck and can't do it by itself. Yeah, it's That's pretty miraculous. It does. It's miraculous how the body can kind of know what it needs, you know? It does. And most of us do so many things that are in our own way and prevent our body from doing what it knows how to do. Well, it's so strange. I mean, when I see those, I don't know if you're pro or con, the pharmaceuticals, probably con, but when I see that stuff that all the fine print where it says if you get within three feet, it'll kill you. And then they've got these happy people dancing through the field. Yes. It's like, <clears throat> It's weird to me why people would I take agree. the Band-Aid. I don't take anything. I take a, a half of an aspirin just to keep my blood thin because I had a mild, I wouldn't even call it a stroke. It was called a transient ischemic attack. Hmm. <laughs> okay. A mild thing that shut me down. But other than that, I don't like doing the drugs. I like the, the natural kind of thing. Sometimes so, drugs are really important. Sometimes they're the best thing and the best alternative. And a lot of times they're not. Yeah, I think uh, like um, when, like we'll use the the Nyquil drug, if you will. I've had situations where I've got a real bad cold, and it just really. So I go ahead and I do one of those shots of Nyquil. I don't like doing it because I like my body to be strong, and and right. learn how to protect itself. But sometimes sometimes it needs some help. Yeah, especially like painkillers and stuff like that. As long as they don't get addictive. Um, it's probably really good because, you know, whenever you're sore, you tense up and then it makes it all difficult. But it is not me. fun to be in pain. No. <clears throat> so this is a little sidebar, but, you know, some people, they tolerate pain much, much better than others. How does that work? You know, <clears throat> you know, it's a real interesting field to study. And I really don't know how that works. And, you know, people talk about pain tolerance. And I think pain tolerance is kind of a goofy concept because there's places that you could come to my body, a massage therapist can push really, really hard and it doesn't, I can handle that. And other people push real hard there and they'd be, you know, bouncing off the ceiling. But if you come at my, my face with a, a drill bit to go in my front tooth, like in Marathon Man, <laughs> I'm out the door one way or the other. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. So pain tolerance is kind of, it depends on where, it depends when. And I listened to this fascinating discourse um, um, on uh, the, the channel that you get on that has all those lectures that go around TED Talks. Sure. You listen to a 10 minute TED Talk. And it talks about this, this guy was talking about how he walked along a trail and he got, he felt something on the side of his sneaker and within hours, he was almost dead of a, of a poisonous snake bite. And to him at that moment, it was only like a, a tip that he uh, ignored on the side of his sneaker. Wow. And come to happen after he healed and several months later, and he's walking in the woods, and he feels something on the side of his sneaker, 
And now it is just a little tit, tidbit, but this time it's searing pain. And he pays attention to it in a very different way. So he started to talk about how pain, your body learns how to warn you if you didn't pay attention the first time when you felt that sensation. So pain tolerance is highly variable depending on how your mind interprets what that pain was supposed to mean. Sure. It's like my, sometimes my wife likes to tickle me and sometimes I can handle it and sometimes I can't. It's the same situation, but. I guess and aren't I, there I, some places that you can handle that tickle and other places where you'd really rather not have that tickle? Exactly. Yeah, same kind of thing. So it's a, that is a, like, again, the natural way of doing things as opposed to prescribed things. Uh, people are different at different times of their lives and different times of the day even, you know? And what we've learned in our years of research and doing this is that in many times, medicine is not what we were taught. And especially pain is not what we were taught. Mm -hmm. What we were taught about pain, in my estimation, works less than 10% of the time. Take a migraine drug. Uh, you take the drug and you know your migraine comes back. Does the drug work? If that was penicillin for your sore throat and it came back as soon as you were done with your medicine, you'd be saying that medicine doesn't work. So exactly. what we were taught about pain and how we treat it and how we even think about it, we've real, really missed the mark by a, a, just such a major way. So when we talk about pain, we talk about most people who come to the doctor they want to know what causes their pain. So we have five rules. I call it the Blattman five rules of CSI for how do you figure out where does your pain come from? And rule number one, you can't believe the pain comes from where you feel it. Your headache, for example, does not come from your head. We were taught that it does. And everybody thinks that it does because that's you know where you hurt. But the headache doesn't come from the head. And there's other examples. For example, the pain in your left arm could be your heart attack. You don't really know. You just know it hurts. And I would suggest also that the pain in your knee does not come mostly from your joint. And the best example are all the friends you have, associates you know, who've had their joint replaced and the knee still hurts and there's no knee there to cause pain. So that's rule number one. Rule number two, contrary to what everything we were taught, it does not matter what you think the pain feels like. For example, we were taught to spend a lot of time teasing out the difference. Where does it burn? Where is it numb? Where does it tingle? All these little qualities of, of the pain. And truth be told, none of them are diagnostic. Burning and numbness and tingling don't mean anything different than aching, uh, sharp, dull. None of it matters. Hmm. All those unpleasant sensations come from the same sort of origin. Rule number three when I do a physical exam on a patient, it's not just me doing the exam, it's me and you examining your body together. And what we're trying to find out is, one, what can your body teach and show me and us that you might not be able to express? And two, can we be sure that what I feel on my side of your skin matches what you feel on your side of your skin? Mm. And we can usually establish that pretty quickly, and now you find out that the only thing you can believe as we do that exam is that where you are specifically tender, millimeter by millimeter, is where the strings of fascia that hold you together are kinked and tied in a knot, or where they attach and weave to you and you've injured them. And rule number four, the places where you are most tender as we do this exam together on your body represent the injuries through your lifetime that your body's had a difficult time healing has incompletely healed, and they represent the cause of most of the pain you are here for. And rule number five, almost always, and usually with about 90% accuracy, it's certainly not 100%. As soon as we unkink these strings that are kinked, and as soon as we heal the anchors that hold you together, the pain you thought you had will go away. And that works about 90% of the time which really makes us think very differently about the entire concept of intractable pain. So headaches go away, TMJ goes away, pelvic pain can go away, foot pain can go away, and it's not a neuralgia, it's not the nerve, it's not the spine, it's not the disc. And most of the time it's not the joint. 
Isn't that well, that fascinating? Makes, that, it is. Uh, the, the concept of the communication of what I might be saying as the patient, are you hearing what I'm saying? It's, it's kind of like if I was speaking Spanish and you didn't speak Spanish, I could be talking all day long telling you about what's wrong. You wouldn't understand. So that makes a lot of sense to be able to line that up. So Line that up. Because uh, I'm assuming even um, like, like you're saying, like a, it doesn't have to be pain. It could end up being just a numbness or, a, or even a tickle. <laughs> Sometimes could... people think the neuropathy, the numbness or altered sensation in their feet and legs is coming from a nerve. But if you haven't had chemotherapy, and you haven't had a reason to have a nerve really be toxic and get injured. A lot of times that comes from your muscles and your fascia being too tight and having had too much trauma that you haven't really learned how to address. It's almost like you get real tense in the shoulders yet because you're using the keyboard, but it's your, it's your hands that are on the keyboard, not necessarily your shoulders that are on the keyboard, but it's affecting up here. It's, but your shoulders have to support your elbows. Right. They're all connected. And your elbows have to stay still for your hands to do that magic work on the keyboard. That's sad. So your, this <laughs> has a sustained contraction. And that sustained contraction, you have injuries. The reason you have these knots and the reason you have these ropes that get really tight in these muscles, because that is indeed where the pain comes from. But the reason is that where you anchor those ropes anchor here and where they anchor in the middle on both sides, you're strong enough to lift your briefcase and your suitcase, but where you anchor isn't strong enough to hold you together when you pull that hard and these slip and tear and nice. these muscles twist into these knots and cords and those kinks in the strings that come from that injury make this pain that we now interpret as headache. And what you need to do is get this to go away and this pain that comes from it stops. And then if you're not strong enough, where your anchors haven't healed well enough, and you go ahead and lift, and every time you carry your briefcase around for the day, you've got all this back again. Now you need to get your body to heal this stronger so you're strong enough to hold together when you pull and do the work. Got it. Wow. And that counts for most of the pain in our bodies just different variations on the theme. Do you have like, um, I'm so, when you do your work and stuff, do you just do you have people come to you or do you do stuff online kind of stuff? Can you, can you talk we can do both. Like that? Can you? We can do both. But most of the time, it's so unbelievable that this is so simple and things can really go away and that unless you experience it and see it and feel it, 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 it really takes a bit to sink in. Sometimes what we've been taught about pain and pinched nerves and herniated discs, and we're so sure that our back pain comes from what was seen on that x-ray, mm -hmm. it's really hard to believe that that's got really very little to do with it. There's some really fascinating examples. Um, one is a, a fellow's a bodybuilder, and he comes to me about three weeks after his injury. He tells me that um, he was lifting weights, and he goes from lifting his weights like he usually does. He runs a mile and a half and he wakes up the next day. He's got this pain in his lower back and it goes down his leg. And he's got this numbness and he went and already saw the, the neurosurgeon. He's scheduled for a discectomy the following week. He's got his MRI in his hand. And I look at the MRI and I examine him. His weakness and his reflexes, weaknesses in the muscle, the pain pattern matches what the MRI says. Herniated disc with herniated free fragment migrating inferiorly and pushing on the nerve. And I looked at the man and I said, you know, I don't think I can help you. Everything that I see on this exam and your MRI says you need to go get that surgery that you're scheduled for. He says, Doc, I'm a bodybuilder. My wife's a dentist. I'm a hygienist. There's no way I'm doing that surgery. I hear you're pretty good with a needle. Let's see what you got. So. This, the, I'm blessed because the work I do has very little chance for harm. Even if I'm on the wrong track, I'm probably not going to cause you an injury. So I'm doing a fairly benign procedure of trigger point injections in the muscles that I thought could be responsible for this lower back pain. And he comes back in two weeks and 90% of the pain is gone. Wow. And he comes back after another two visits and all of it's gone. I don't see him again for 10 years. And he comes back in 10 years and the pain is back. I do the same 
treatment again, have the same basic exam again, all the pain goes away again. And I look at him and I say, you have health insurance. Do you mind if we do an MRI scan? He goes, what for? My pain's gone. I said, because I've been wondering for 10 years what happened to that disc. And I teach about you. I use you as an example. But, you know, now it's 10 years later. And I always wondered. So we do an MRI scan. He's got four levels of herniated discs now, not just one. No migrating pieces like what it was before, but still four herniated discs and he's pain free. Now, I can't figure that out because what I can tell you after that is even with what I know after doing this for almost 30 years, I still don't know whether you need that surgery until I do this other work and find out whether your body can just transform this or not. Because most of the time that radiating pain does not come from the disc and there is no nerve that's being pinched. Even though it shows it on the MRI, that's not necessarily the cause of the numbness goes down your leg. There's another example that I really um, set me straight. This man comes and he's, he's been a patient for a few years. He always colors yellow for numbness and tingling down the back of his legs. And he's had his low back surgery infusion 10 years prior. He's a, a worker's comp injury. He settles his claim. He can afford some of the higher tech things that we can do to help people heal. And I go after healing some of the muscles in his glutes and tendons and his, and he comes back a month later and he says, doc, two days after we did that procedure for the first time in 10 years, I can feel my dog lick the bottoms of my feet. <laughs> now I didn't touch his, his back, didn't touch his disc, didn't touch a nerve. None of that was sciatic related. But we would have all thought that and we all believed that and that's what he believed and that's what we, that's what his care had been based on. Mm -hmm. So pain is not what we were taught. Headaches don't come from your head. Your lower back pain does not necessarily come from your lower back. And trust what you feel. Because when you feel that there's a tight string and band that goes down your neck and down into your shoulder, there really is. Mm -hmm. And this fascia has the ability to tighten independently because there's muscle fibers in the fascia. So when you get home after carrying your briefcase all day and your shoulders are up like this, well, your fascia tightened so that your muscles didn't have to do all the work. You know, it's, it sounds like you almost have, have to kind of like have an engineering degree to realize which muscle hooks to another muscle that hooks to another muscle that affects another muscle. And it could there's be a wonderful, there's a wonderful work called Anatomy Trains by Tom Myers that he did what's called fascia sparing dissection and showed how this engineering is all hooked up. And you're absolutely right. Most pain is an engineering problem, not <laughs> just an inflammation problem. We have structural defects in our engineering. And a lot of it is from prior trauma. Aren't For I example, brilliant? <laughs> you got it. So a lot of times the back pain we think we have, the origin of that is the injuries to the tendons that hold us when we jumped out of trees when we were children. Mm -hmm. And we jumped down the steps. And you were either the kid that led the other kids, watched the other kids, or followed the other kids off the roof. Wow. And you'd be amazed how many of us jumped off roofs. And I've even heard the comment, no, for me, it was a hayloft. And yeah. I didn't believe that hay was not as soft when I landed on it as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Whoops. I, I've heard people say, yeah, that's a big To jump off the roof into snow banks here in Minnesota. Yes. And I grew up in um, my first several years of life, uh, Pittsfield, Massachusetts. So I remember the plows coming through and the snow banks taller than twice my dad and we sure. could build big tunnel I, i'm totally with you <laughs> well this has been really fascinating I, I, i'd like to go longer but maybe we could do another one sometime but it's a couple things that hit home with me was the concept of communication with where you where the patient might not be telling you or, or the doctor might not be listening to what the patient's really saying or the and patient it, doesn't know how to express it yeah yeah if you if you um take this to the next level when you when a patient has this pain sometimes it can feel like numbness and burning and tingling all at the same time and sometimes it varies between one and the other if you really tell the doctor what you're really thinking they might think you're a little goofy because it doesn't fit what we were taught 
Sure. And yet, that is exactly what you feel. Yeah, I'm assuming that even if you had a dream about it at night when you're sleeping, that could result when you're in your waking time. So we find to get rid of pain, if we can do this process of diagnosis by what we're calling the Blattman method, then it follows directly from there what you need to do to make the pain go away. Huh. And basically, you need to unkink the strings and heal the anchor areas wherever they need it. they're not strong enough. And as fast as you do that, the pain goes away. So we use prolotherapy, trigger point injections, myofascial release. And we teach you as the patient what to do to your own body and fascia to maintain it because you should be able to make most of your own pain go away. Mm -hmm. If you come in and see me with foot pain and it really comes from the things that we find before you leave the room on your first visit, your foot already feels better and you know what to do to your body to keep that going in the right direction. Wow. And then we talk about food. We do the same thing with headaches. Do the same thing with pelvic pain. It's not pudendal neuralgia. You don't need your nerve cut on most all the time or with rare exception. And then we talk about food, the great equalizer. I could say with a fair degree of, of certainty that in most people, at least 50% of the chronic pain you experience, if you're a chronic pain patient, comes from the inflammatory reaction in your biology from the food your body does not want you to eat. Wow. That you've eaten sometime in the last six weeks. Well, that, that makes sense. You know, they also to say you are what you eat and that's kind of what, uh, what we're building. And you, makes sense. And, you know, you, we eat for, for just a couple reasons. We, we eat to get fuel to burn and we eat to get raw materials to build spare or new parts when you think about it. When we eat and what we eat is all about taste and hunger, and none of that is really important. The basic biologic needs, they're important, but the biologic needs are fuel to burn and raw materials to make parts. And so what quality of fuel are you putting in? And what are you putting in to build new parts from? Exactly. So do you have a website that you can share that we can find out more about? Because this could, this could go on forever, it sounds like. And I don't want to do this too long because of that commodity of time. But how do we Yes, get I do. Um, BlattmanHealthAndWellness.com. We field all questions from across the country in our Cincinnati main office. I'm in Manhattan once a month to see patients there. I also teach at a naturopathic medical college, Best Year University in Seattle. And I have a small... Uh, practice and a few patients there. Most of our work is in Cincinnati. And okay. if you need long, really serious care, you'll come to Cincinnati for five days. We do platelet-rich plasma. We use stem cells. We use prolozone and prolotherapy and all the real awesome tricks of the trade. I was, uh, I'm was i a past president of the American Holistic Medical Association. We're part of herbal therapy and all kinds of things that really help your biology do what it otherwise can't. You can go to our website, sign up for the newsletter, and we will send you this do not eat list that we already just alluded to. <laughs> okay, so the, it's blattmanhealthandwellness.com. So B-L-A-T-M-A-N? Correct. And Health spell it all out. And, and wellness.com. I will uh, link that in with all the blogging and propagation that I will do, and I'll hashtag it out there. So I appreciate you taking the time. I'm going to sign this off and beam it up to the universe. Got Thank me you, Magic about Brad. Some new things here. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Hal. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.